Okay, thanks. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, able to introduce uh, uh, Dirk uh, Bergman. Uh, Dirk Bergman, of course, requires no introduction. He's, uh, he's a leading theorist of our time. But in the tradition of our conference, let me just uh, briefly go over his bio. Um, uh, Dirk Bergman is, uh, is uh, Douglas and Marion Campbell Professor of Economics at, at Yale University. He's a fellow and uh, executive committee member of the Econometric Society. He served as co-editor of Econometrica, is now a co-editor of AER, American Economic Review Insights, uh, since 2020. Um, you know, he made uh, similar contributions in many areas, uh, but uh, notably in the areas of dynamic mechanism design, dynamic pricing, uh, more recently robust mechanism design, and more, more recently information design. So we are very happy to have uh, Dirk here to talk about selling impressions, efficiency versus competition. So Dirk, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Yonku. Um, it was a very nice introduction. And, and thank you, Julian, for the uh, invitation to give you this um, early morning talk um, here in the US. Um, I would re much rather be in Singapore than <laughs> waking up very early. <laughs> but um, let me um, uh, try my best here to present you this uh, work. I will now share my screen. Yonku, great. Excellent. Good. Yes. Um, wonderful. So this is um, a just recently completed work together um, with um, co-authors Thibaut and Stephen. Um, we presented this early in the summer when we became aware of um, very related work by Constantine and Eyal. And so we put this work together. And what you've seen here is hopefully sort of the combination of best results uh, from our two um, joint papers. Um, as the title may uh, suggest, Selling Impression, um, this is partly about auction and partly about uh, digital advertising. And um, as, as many of you know, web content today is primarily monetized by ads. And so uh, the opportunities to show ads whenever you are going to look um, at uh, either a search output or on your favorite website uh, for publications, impressions are traded by an auction and that happens both in search and display advertising. And what I mean by trading is that if you want to think about the publisher as the seller of the space uh, that the website user is visiting and the advertisers as the bidder for that space, then the object of the auction um, is really the viewer, or if you wish, um, the attention or the eyeball of the viewer. So um, we are in a situation where we basically have uh, the sellers as a publisher um, offering uh, auctions for the advertisers. Think about the publisher being the New York Times. Uh, one possible advertiser, for example, could be the Bank of America, who would like to display uh, its financial services. Um, whenever that happens, the publisher on uh, the internet uh, really face a fundamental trade-off in deciding how much information um, to provide the advertisers about the viewers. But the, the publisher has uh, quite a bit of information in terms of browsing history, characteristics, uh, and other uh, elements about the viewer. And so the more he conveys to the advertisers about the segment to which he advertising, um, the better can be the match between advertiser and viewer. And so possibly there's more surplus to be split between publisher and advertiser. But the more information you provide, um, the thinner becomes the market, the more segmented it becomes the market. And so the information rent for the advertiser um, is rising. Uh, a very nice uh, papers and proceedings paper by Levin and Milgram discusses this as their leading example of a more general conflation question, namely how to draw boundaries between goods uh, in order to uh, both create a market that is liquid enough, large enough, and, and also one that allows for efficient matching. Um, so here, uh, in this context of digital advertising, the, the question is how much information would the publisher like the advertisers to have about the goods that they're buying, which is basically the identity or the description of the viewers. 
to the extent that different buyers may have different uh, informations, uh, this will lead to, to a different bidding behavior in the auction. And so the central question that I want to pose to you today is the one of how much information should we ideally give the advertisers um, about the valuation of the good. And here we want to think about impression and auction. Perhaps the answer is a lot to maximize efficiency to create the best match. Perhaps the answer is very little in order to maximize competition and keep the, the market thick, or uh, maybe something in between um, to, to find the optimal trade-off. We're going to do this today, uh, first at a fairly high and abstract level um, by sort of abstracting away from a lot of the interesting features that we think are in the market for impressions and just consider um, a classic single, a single object, second price auction, where there are many bidders with symmetric and independent private values. But we want to allow the seller to control how much information each bidder or each buyer has about the private value. Okay. And then in the second step, I want to think about um, using this framework and then implementing it with uh, a much tighter and sort of more detailed description of the market for impressions to suggest that the uh, control of information that we're going to model here first abstractly uh, can very naturally be implemented uh, in the environment of digital advertising. Okay. So uh, with full information or with complete disclosure, if you wish, um, the second price auction allows for an efficient allocation, but also grants the bidders quite a bit of information. With no information, no disclosure over and above becoming prior, there will be inefficiency. Uh, but on the other hand, there won't be any information rent. Um, and so these are basically the two extremes that we can think about. And we want to think about um, whether the maximum in terms of maximizing the revenue in the second price auction um, can be achieved by uh, improved uh, information design. And we're going to indeed keep the second price auction, the standard second price auction without any reserve price for the first part of the analysis and simply think about the flow of information enhancing um, the, the, the possibly the revenue of the seller. Okay, and indeed we're going to show that the optimal information structure is something in between uh, and a sharp characterization can be given as follows. The low value buyers are essentially told their value, so they are completely uh, disclosed the information, but all of the high valuation bidders are pooled. So there's just a single segment um, of high valuation buyers. All they're being told is that their value exceeds the threshold, uh, but not more than that. The critical threshold depends just on the critical threshold in terms of the quantile of bidders being pooled depends just on the number of buyers that is just on the level of competition if you wish and is in fact independent of the distribution of values so that's quite the opposite from optimal auction design if you wish where of course the optimal reserve price does not depend on the number of buyers but does depend on the distribution of values in the optimal information designs it's exactly the opposite the intuition is that competition is the lowest when there's a high winning value, right? Then the distance between first and second order statistic is largest. That means the information rent is largest. We essentially want to compress the information rent and we're willing to do that even at the expense um, of the efficiency because whenever we pool the information, we're basically depriving us of being able to distinguish who really has the highest and who has the second highest value. But that um, loss in efficiency is more than offset by the gains that come from the depression in the information. And then I'm going to give you uh, the few arguments that lead to this result um, in hopefully in a few steps. Okay, and this is our first main contribution. And then we're going to, uh, the second contribution is to think about this uh, in a richer environment for digital advertising, where we want to think about viewers as being heterog heterogeneous in their characteristics, their preferences, their browsing history. 
Uh, and likewise, the advertisers display a corresponding degree of heterogeneity in their willingness to pay for the characteristics of the buyer. Okay? And uh, we're going to show that when we basically think about uh, fusing these two dimensions of information together, uh, we have an environment that's rich enough to uh, replicate, in fact, implement uh, the information design, the optimal information design that we suggest in the very beginning. Okay, and in the paper you find us doing that um, in two forms in which the information flows into the bit, two forms that are currently being used in digital advertising. One is called automated bidding. Here, um, bidders provide information about their willingness to pay, and then that's being augmented by the information that the sellers has about the viewer segment, and then at least generate automatically uh, to a bid that is formed by the effort, by the auctioneer, actually by the seller. Okay, um, so that it basically leads to compression of the incentive constraint. In manual bidding, um, there's a second step in which the seller merges information from uh, the bidder and the seller, but then allows the advertiser to place a bid given that merged information. And so that leads to, uh, to two sets of incentive constraints. As you might imagine in, in the world of digital advertising, where we need to generate these displays, this impression very quickly, um, there's a move towards auto bidding because that basically increases the speed at which this market is being generated. And so, um, so we will have something to say about that. Okay, so these are the two pieces um, of, um, of what I'm going to show you to you today, and um, let's head right into it. Unless there's a question, I'm happy to take questions at this point. Good. So the model um, is indeed quite simple um, and straightforward. Um, there's simply an advertisers who bid for the view in a second price auctions. Each one of them has a private value that's symmetrically and independent distributed. But the bidder can choose an information structure um, that presents their values in a coarser manner. And let's call this information structure signal uh, by SI that maps from the value into a distribution of signals. Okay. This signal in turn generates a distribution over the posterior expectation that is called this WI. And, and that's the information that the bidders have at the moment when they place their bid. Okay. The objective um, is going to be for the seller to find the information structure that maximizes the revenue in the second price auction, okay. where the revenue is simply equal to the second highest expected valuation across the bids. More generally, the K highest valuation is denoted by WK. And so we're phrasing everything in terms of this posterior expectation because they may not have access to, um, to the complete uh, description of the value. And so the objective for the seller is really to maximize the expectation of the second order statistic. And he can influence, the seller can influence a second order statistic by choosing an information structure that in turn generates um, the posterior expectation of the bidders. Okay, so that's, that's the objective that we're going to uh, focus on today. And uh, as you see, we're, um, yeah. Okay. So, so really a standard second prize auction, except that we're going to shape um, the evaluation, the distribution of the valuation, subject, of course, to, uh, to Bayesian consistency. Okay, so I'm, I'm ready then to jump um, towards the analysis. Um, and, and rephrasing, we, we attempt here to find the optimal symmetric information structure. I phrased it just as natural initially in terms of the signal, but really all that we're interested in uh, is trying to find a distribution G over the posterior expectation. Okay. Um, a long set of results, generalizing and, and sort of finding applications in economics, Blackwell, Strachan, Rothschild, and Stiglitz show 
that there exists a signal that induces a distribution of expected valuation G from the underlying value F, if and only F, if and only if F is a mean preserving spread of G. Okay. Or in other words, G um, is a, uh, a contraction of, the, uh, of F. Okay. Because I can only provide less information than G, and so that is uh, the part of the contraction. F is a mean preserving spread of G, that's the formal definition. And uh, we denote um, with the preceding relationship F, uh, F is dominated by G if F is a mean preserving spread of G. So this uses the language of uh, majorization here that's been introduced in the 20s by Hardy, Little, Watt, and Paul. Okay, we are clearly focused on the second order statistic of these n-symmetric and independent distributed random variables, okay, and that second order statistic, not of the original distribution f, but of the chosen distribution g that possibly compresses the information um, is given in the first line so that I can rewrite the expected revenue of the seller in terms of this integral. Um, where the object is in fact to choose a distribution G uh, that is a mean preserving construct, mean preserving contraction of F. Okay. Um, that's a maximization problem that we're going to try to solve. That's the last slide here. Okay. And um, let me make a few observations. One is that, of course, um, the object, the, the tool, the instrument here, G, um, appears in a highly nonlinear manner in this objective function, right? Raised to the power of n minus one or n um, and appearing in this product. Second, uh, the constraint that G uh, dominates F is in fact a continuum of constraints in terms of the integral inequality that we saw before. So it seems to be um, a rather inaccessible program. It, it's nonlinear, it's neither convex nor concave, uh, and it has a continuum uh, of constraints. Okay. The trick that we're going to, uh, that allows us to make quite a big progress and restate the same problem uh, in a much easier way is to phrase it rather than in the underlying problem of the values, okay, in terms of the quantile. And the quantile has the uh, interesting feature from our point of view that in fact, it is independent of the underlying distribution, okay, F or G. And it will turn out that we um, can rewrite the program in a way that in fact, the problem is linear in, uh, in the quantile. Okay, so the quantile is just the inverse of the distribution function. It is uniformly distributed for the underlying distribution f. Uh, but interesting, we can also think about the distribution function of the quantile of the second highest valuation, that is n subscript n, where the subscript is simply to alert us to the fact that this distribution does indeed depend on, on the number of samples that we're getting, and here it's n. Okay, so s of n is this expression uh, that just as the, the quantile itself is independent of the underlying distribution f or g. Okay. And, and so that's, that's a new object <clears throat> that we're going to work with. And we can then write the revenue uh, as an expectation over um, quantiles, okay, using the measure um, s of n. Okay. And after integration by part, we can in fact um, represent the same revenue maximizing problem that we had before in terms of the second order statistic. Now, in terms of just the underlying distribution G minus one, that's the, um, that's the quantile and therefore the value, okay, subject to this new constraint. This is the second nice feature of the I mean preserving spread ordering, namely, um, that we can order f and g uh, 
uh, or we can change the orientation and we can order the quantile of f and g, by which case it is simply the inequality or the ordering that is reversed, the orientation of the ordering is reversed, okay? But what you clearly see now is that this objective becomes linear in G uh, or, in, or in the quantile. And so um, it will be essentially now a linear program that we have to analyze. And so for that, we can use uh, then quite a bit of mathematics that has recently been uh, established. In fact, um, let me just stop here for a second. This problem is so easy that the, um, that the version that Constantine and AL solved um, could solve this problem in some sense from scratch. Uh, we are going in this proof avail ourselves to a recent result of um, Kleiner Moldovan on Strack, who have a nice characterization of the extreme points um, that, that will come in handy. But let me state you first the main result of the paper which is a description of the optimal information search, okay? So uh, the claim that we're making is that um, the, um, under weak assumption F, the unique optimal symmetric information structure has this feature that we're going to disclose in terms of the signal and the value that each bidder has, okay? if his value happens to be in a quantile which is below the threshold Q star, but if its value is in a quantile that is above that threshold in terms of the Q star, then we're going on to told him this posterior expectation conditional on the fact that the value is in a quantile higher than Q star. Okay. And the determination of the Q star is coming from a polynomial that just depends on n and not on the underlying distribution f. Uh, so indeed, uh, it is independent of f. Okay. And um, this two-part description basically says we're going to completely disclose and therefore have a, an inefficient allocation if it so happens that all the values are going to be below um, q star. And um, if the values are, or some values are going to be above Q star in terms of the quantile, we're going to have some inefficiency because we're going to be unable to distinguish who among the winning bidders has in fact um, the highest value. We only know that they belong to the highest pool of values. And so in the literature and information design, this particular information structure has often been referred to as upper censorship because we're basically censoring um, the upper values and representing them by just a single expectation. So by a quantization of the, of the upper interval, essentially. Yes? This is... Um, the main result, and, and um, while I focused on the highest winning bidder, uh, we'll see later on that we choose the Q star in such a way, so let me uh, anticipate that, that in expectation, they're going to be typically uh, around two bidders who in fact land in this higher pool. And if there are two bidders who land in this higher pool, then the second price auction, um, it means that we're going to, basically extract all of the surplus from the bidders um, as the second highest bid is going to be equal to the highest bid. Okay. okay. And, and of course it leads therefore to uh, depression of the information rent of the winning bidder at the corresponding game in the revenue of the seller. Okay. Um, let me just uh, walk you quickly um, through, through the critical steps and the proof and give you a geometrical description. So um, you, you see uh, on the left of this equation, our original formulation in terms of the quantile and the measure over the second order statistic. Integration by part gives this in a form that we can immediately access the, the linear control or the DG um, part, okay? to subject to the reverse oriented majorization result, not in terms of the original distribution, but in terms of the quantile, okay? And so um, let me give you now a geometric representation of this. This is now the graph of the distribution of the quantile of the second order statistic. 
for three. Okay, so uh, on the x-axis is q and the y-axis is the distribution that ranges between zero and one. Here I'm going to display you um, just the property uh, that this distribution has for n equal to three. A common feature that is independent of n is that this uh, distribution is in fact um, has a unique inflection point so it changes exactly once from convex to concave and if you recall um, due to the change in orientation we are not looking at the maximization problem but we're going to look at the minimization problem uh, what we want to indeed find here is the convex hall of the quantile function. So we want to find uh, the largest convex hall that sits below uh, the quantile function. And we want to describe uh, the property that that convex hall has. Okay. And so uh, what you find here is that the convex hull uh, is created by tracing along the convex part our original distribution, but on the concave part, we're going to replace it uh, by a linear segment that is created uh, between two points that will have the property that the expected mean now of the quantile has to be held constant, okay? And so this is a picture um, that emerges when we look at the distribution of the quantile of the second order statistic. But of course, we want to describe the information structure in terms of the underlying value of each individual beta, because that's the object um, which we can control. So, so let me try to do this here. That is simply retrace what we did to the second order statistic now to the quantile of the underlying distribution. Okay, and I'm going to do this now for a specific distribution. So it's going to be the root distribution. Remember the quantile was distribution independent, but the, the, uh, the distribution of course has been given. So um, our two mass points here are going to now lead to two jumps in um, the quantile distribution. Okay, this is, moved at the end point and if we're now translating this from the quantile function to the underlying distribution remember on the y-axis we still have a description of the quantile then the two jumps in the quantile now just turning into one jump in the distribution and two flat parts in the distribution which is f of x and that gives you now the original distribution of the information structure that for low values follows the distribution, whatever it is, and for high values bundles them all in one pool. And that one pool has, um, is represented by a representation point, which is the conditional expectation in that pool. Okay. Um, this is an example, uh, you know, our rewriting leads us to an example of a linear function subject to a majorization constraint. And there's a verification result um, in the uh, paper by Kleiner, Moldovan, and Strzok uh, that tells us that these extreme points that we have been looking for are in fact um, the candidates and under the conditions that uh, are being met in the current problem are in fact uh, the unique candidates for the optimum. And so that closes the argument, okay? Uh, in terms of the characterization and the uniqueness of the optimal symmetric information structure. Um, can we say a little bit more about the nature of the critical quantile and how the information structure uh, moves as we have more and more competition? Our intuition clearly is that to the extent that competition increases, we need to use the tools uh, of the information design less, meaning the quantile should increase. And, and that's in fact the case. And the optimal quantile um, is dependent just on this equation that we can formulate in terms of S and its derivative. Uh, and it's a polynomial, um, which we can completely describe in terms of a monotonicity. And, um, here you see a little plot of how the quantile changes um, as the bidders is changing. So it's increasing slowly in its march towards one as we increase the bidders. And with 10 bidders, uh, the quantile is still at just uh, 0.8, meaning there's still a substantial amount of compression and gains from the information design. Okay. 
Okay. The more interesting, I apologize for that, the more interesting number is probably the number at the very end of the slide, so it's at the very bottom. If you're asking what's the expected numbers of bidders at the top of the distribution, okay, uh, then that number, and maybe the number uh, of bidders times the probability that the bidders are in this quanta, then that number uh, is basically somewhere around two, no matter what n is. And in fact, it goes up towards 2.5 um, if n uh, goes towards infinity. So, so it's basically saying that we're choosing the quantile so that in expectation, we have sufficient competition at the top. And of course, in the logic of the second price or the logic of the trunk competition, sufficient competition means really that we have two bidders. And that's precisely what the optimal information structure uh, is going to try to achieve. Just to clarify, Derek, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. so it converges to 2.25. What did I hear you saying 2.5 or 2.25? Uh, sorry, 2.25. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, let me uh, skip um, the variational argument that we, we, you know, just as in the logic um, of um, optimal monopoly pricing, a la um, Bülow and Roberts, we can ask what's the marginal increase of lowering the threshold or increasing the threshold. Right, so that's sort of the logic uh, of optimal monopoly pricing that, in fact, gives us um, the description of optimal pricing in terms of the virtual utility. This is a very nice, clean description of how we should price optimally, either in the auction or in, in the single bidder optimal monopoly price. We can do the same thing here, of course. Uh, taking as granted that the optimal information structure, in fact, has this upper censorship property. We have already established that. And what we find is that um, a marginal increase or decrease in the threshold uh, will come with a marginal gain because that we will uh, see more sales, but it will come with the lowering of the price. Okay. Interestingly, this trade-off uh, can now be phrased just in terms of the distribution of the second order of the quantile of the second order distribution, so S n or S prime of n. Okay, and any other information about the distribution of the valuation completely drops out, as do the actual threshold, and so therefore. Uh, we get at the condition that we saw before, which is a determination of the quantile in terms of just the distribution of the quantile. Okay. So, so quite um, opposite. And um, often a, in the in digital advertising, a reserve price is actually chosen. So um, here, what you see is just the extension of this result when um, we want to use a reserve price and we're asking how would the presence of a reserve price change the optimal information design and um, it substantially would not, but the presence of a reserve price would allow us or give us a motivation to in fact uh, introduce a second interval of pooling, not just around the upper pool, that's a V bar, uh, but also around the reserve price because we basically want to pool all the values around R to um, manage an increasing numbers of sale at the reserve price. Okay, but the, um, the presence of a reserve price um, does not change the basic argument that we want to induce competition now, not just at the upper pool, but also the critical threshold of a given reserve price. Good. Um, let me stop here um, with the first part of the argument, and now let me um, shift gears a little bit and think about how we can implement uh, or how we can think about the choice of information structure that was presented initially in an abstract manner and without any constraints uh, on the seller's control of information in a world of indeed distributed information. Okay, and so um, let me let me give you um, a model of the market for impressions where um, the control that I offered the seller initially is one that is in fact incentive compatible and corresponds to uh, 
to tools that are available both to the seller uh, or the publisher in this market. Okay. So I'm happy to take a, a little break here and, 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 and pause, but otherwise let me spend maybe the next uh, 10 minutes uh, on this um, sort of slightly more elaborate model uh, in which we expand um, the, the definition or our view of what the value is from uh, the natural one-dimensional view to really high-dimensional view on how values are being generated. Okay, so the, the, the perspective that we're now taking is that the viewer as the object of the auction has many attributes, demographics, past browsing, past purchasing. Okay. And the publisher as seller has private information about those attributes of the viewer. Okay. So think about this basically as uh, all the cookies and all the past browsing behavior that the publisher or in fact the uh, auction platform, think about Google, can have access to. The advertiser, as a bidder, on the other hand, has private information about their preferences, their willingness to pay for the attributes of the view, whether he wants to uh, access a view on the West Coast, on the East Coast, whether he wants to access a young um, consumer or an, an, a middle-aged consumer. Okay? And the value of the match really comes from um, the uh, combination of the advertiser's preferences and the attributes of uh, the viewers. And so now we have a, a two-dimensional or at least a two-sided um, sources of private information. Okay? Formally, we want to think that the viewer has attributes that are distributed according to some distribution F. And the advertiser has preferences for those attributes let's call them y and they're called also distributed according to another distribution f of y and an impression is really a match between advertisers and viewer is a match between those attributes x that can be high dimensional and the preferences that can also be equally high dimensional okay and together x and y is generating a value and then in turn together they induce a distribution over values Okay. Okay. So the statistical assumption that uh, we're now going to make and then give a model that satisfies all of those is that um, an advertiser's preferences alone, so just a vector y alone, tells them nothing about um, the va their valuation of the object beyond the prior or uh, other valuations of object. Likewise, a publisher's knowledge of the viewer's attributes tells them nothing about the valuations of the bidders. And so, in other words, we want to say that the vector x uh, and the valuation of all the bidders and y and the valuation of all the bidders are, in fact, vectors of independently distributed randomness. Okay, so here is one model that essentially gives you. Um, a model of horizontal differentiation. Each viewer has many attributes, call them capital J. They're all binary. And each advertiser has many preferences for these attributes, and they're also binary. Um, and so you basically have now a, a pair of vectors, x and y, that form the underlying characteristic. An impression is a match between advertisers and viewer. And let's call that number as uh, simply m of i. We're going to normalize it because by the numbers of attributes, because in particular, we can now think about a model with many attributes and taking the limit as we go to, uh, to a normal distribution. Okay, but what this number m is capturing is basically the number of uh, matched or aligned attributes where the sign of the viewer's attributes and the sign of the preference attributes is the same, then it enters as plus one. If they are not the same, then it enters at minus one. So um, taking for the moment that the distribution of the attributes and preferences is independent and uniform, uh, what this gives us is basically that the, the, the expected value of the number of matches is zero, and it varies from uh, minus j to capital J. Okay. The advertiser's value is just a function 
of the number of successful matches and it's increasing. Okay. Okay, so, so that's sorry, that, uh, sorry, can I but so mm -hmm. MI is not the number of successful matches, right? MI is the, yes, it is because yes. you are well, normalized, right? Normalized by um right, so normalized um by the fact that unsuccessful matches enter as minus one successful HZ enters as MI. So I, I could equally um restate this as the numbers of successful matches that would be just a monotone function. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, so um, I think I probably have just time for a model of auto bidding um, and, and a state uh, model of manual bidding first. So the, the way we want to approach this is here that the publisher commits to a mechanism, uh, both in terms of, of course, using a second price auction, but then also to a mechanism that says he's going to generate signals about the viewer's attribute as a function of the advertiser's reported preferences. So it's augmenting the information that's coming from the advertisers by the information that he has. And after he has augmented that information, he's then going to place a bid on behalf of the advertiser that is the optimal bid in a second price auction as a function of the reported preferences and the publisher signals. And then uh, the auction outcome is realized and um, the allocation and impression is formed. Okay, so in words or in in in, in notation rather, uh, this means we're going to choose an information structure that responds both to the reported prefer the reported attributes and the reported preferences. Okay, and uh, generates a signal, or in other words, gives a signal about the expected value that depends on the reported attributes the ported preferences and then the attributes of uh, the object or the view. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to complement the advertiser's preference with attribute information. And then I'm going to submit a bit on behalf of the advertiser that uh, is optimal in a second price auction is simply the expected value that the bidder has. Okay. The, the critical aspect, and that's going to distinguish auto bidding from manual bidding, is the fact that um, the incentive constraints for the bidder uh, only appears once, namely um, that the bidder wants to, or we want to make sure that the bidder has an incentive to truthfully report his preferences. Afterwards, uh, the bidder does not have the means to deviate from the bidding policy that we have once um, committed to. Okay. Um, in the symmetric environment, in terms of the attributes of preferences, really what matters is um, the uh, number of truthfully reported uh, preferences. So we can uh, say we can phrase everything in terms of this ratio of um, truthfully versus not truthfully reported preferences, Ti, that's just a number that varies from minus one to one. And the, the first result here is that under the optimal information structure, it is a dominant strategy for the advertiser to report truthfully his preferences to the publishers. Okay, so um, that means that we can in this world um, guarantee incentive compatibility uh, and allow the seller to have sufficient amount of control over the flow of information so that we can implement the optimal information structure that we chose in the first part without any constraints on true selling by the bidder. Okay. Um, let me just give you a, a, not an argument, but a preview of how this result changes. Um, with manual bidding or so under manual bidding we still want to make sure that the bidder um, tells his preference truthfully but after the advertiser has complemented uh, the preferences with additional attribute information from the seller now it's the advertiser's choice to place a bid and so there will be a big recommendation coming from the seller but this bidder doesn't have to follow up on this recommendation. So now we basically have a two set of incentive constraint, the truth telling constraint and the obedience constraint. Okay. In this case, 
the problem is harder and indeed we can show that true setting is not an equilibrium anymore for every n and u okay but what we can show is uh, a slight modification of our optimal information structure that now not pools only at the top with the same quantile q star but also the bottom okay coarsens the information that we have to provide to the bidder in such a way that we re-establish uh, incentive compatibility strictly and as you might imagine that coarsening of the information at the very bottom of the distribution has very little impact on the revenue as long as there are sufficiently large bidders and so this uh, information structure is not um, exactly optimal but is in fact approximately optimal as long as the number of bidders becomes sufficiently large and so um, what I have done now is to basically give you um, two bidding algorithms or two bidding mechanisms that um, allows the seller to control the information, control the flow of information, yet do that while maintaining um, truth telling and to some extent also obedience uh, in a setting that is um, a, a first good approximation of the very high dimensional information data that we have in digital advertising. Okay. Um, Okay, I uh, perhaps just want to flag um, that. Oh, by the way, you can take maybe an additional two or three minutes. Exactly. So let me uh, let me just think a little bit about um, the scenario of large markets, um, which are markets where um, there are many bidders. That's arguably um, the right condition for. Um, the internet market where this is at least um, a large number of possible bidders. So if you want to think about, you know, um, random participation of bidders and we want to think that the number of possible bidders is large, the actual realized number of bidders might be small. And so one question that we're interested in is whether the role of information design remains relevant even in this world of many bidders. So whether the analysis we have offered to you is robust, um, even when the when there might be a large number of bidders okay and i'm going to do this um, in two versions in the one version we're going to have indeed uh, a random number of bidders okay so we want to think about um possibly large number of bidders n but the probability that a bidder occurs or that a bid occurs or that he has a non-trivial valuation is simply one minus p with probability p a bidder has value zero which means he doesn't participate in the auction okay so that the expected number of participating bidders is simply captured in this variable lambda okay as we saw earlier on the critical uh number of expected bidders is rho, sorry, and I, I, I got the, um, the convergence uh, in the wrong direction. So as we have a larger number of bidders, the expected number of bidders drops and it goes towards 1.79, so just below two rather than just above two, okay? Um, the, the first result that we are interested in here is, is there going to be a role for information design as the number of possible bidder increases, okay, but the number of expected bidders stays constant, that's just lambda, okay, uh, and what we find here is that that's indeed the case, so uh, whether lambda is large or small, whether it's above or below the critical threshold, we're going to use information design, and uh, we're going to basically use uh, zero value bidders to create a to create a larger pool of possible competitors and so we're going to lower the valuation intentionally simply to increase the competition so that's something that um, is often referred to as broad search um, in a very interesting paper in, a few years ago, Anosti, Beck, and Milgram argued that the heavy tail, and so that's the second take that we want to take here, uh, heavy tail distributions prevail in digital advertising. So there are basically always a few bidders with very large valuations, 
think about them as basically offering the perfect match between the interest of the viewer and the advertisers. Okay, and so um, we're going to drop random participation. We in fact going to think about a large number of bidders, but we're going to uh, maintain a heavy tail. Okay, and indeed um, with heavy tails. Uh, the gap, if you want to think about it, the revenue ratio of what can be achieved between complete disclosure, that is sort of running a second price auction without information design, and maintaining information design, so bundling the values at the very end of the tail, um, as long as we have a heavy tail distribution, that gap remains positive, um, so bounded away, bounded from uh, below above one, uh, whenever we have a heavy tail distribution, if we have many bits. So that suggests that um, there remains substantial scope for information design, even if we have many bits. Okay. And I think um, with this, I'm sort of um, ready to conclude. Um, so I'll, I'll focus on the second price auction. Uh, but using revenue equivalence result, we can clearly generalize the results that I gave to you here to basically all the standard auctions in terms of first price all pay auctions. Um, we talked about how information design would be impacted by a reserve price. Um, I want to emphasize that the model of the market impression that I suggested to you is really one of horizontal differentiation because knowing um, my preferences as uh, as the bidder or knowing the attributes doesn't tell me something about the value unless i augment this by my preferences um, is something that sort of reflect the quality of a match along horizontal uh, dimensions if we had vertical differentiation when a particular attribute would be more valued by all of the bidders we would of course get in a in a setting where we would have common or correlated values and uh, that would make the analysis substantially more complicated in particular would depart from independent private values so so we leave that uh, as an open question for some future research okay um, i think that's where i want to end for today okay Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think we have, even though, I mean, officially we have uh, four minutes left, I think that, you know, given that uh, there is a kind of a rather long break afterwards, we, we could take uh, a few questions from the floor. So I think there are 55 people attending the talk. So I think to, to best organize, perhaps you should it's good for, it would be nice if you can raise your hand. So. so I guess, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm seeing the raising of hands <laughs> from my vantage point. It's in the, I mean, I, you might not see of everybody. So it's in the left. Um, uh, left uh, top corner. Uh, I can see Francis and Andrea. I don't. Um... Yeah, maybe it's uh, somehow I don't see it. Maybe you could uh, you could just pick one of them. I have. Well, I why have don't we, Andrea, myself. ask a question? Let's start with Francis, and then we can uh, come back to uh, Andrea. Okay. okay thanks. Thank sorry. you. <laughs> thanks, Yanko. So I have a question about um, in the market for impressions. About um, I'm worried about the number of uh, VIs that you have to know as a, as a seller. So in other words, I'm wondering whether uh, there's a cost actually for the seller of uh, learning the, um, the values. And if you think about matches, if you have, should we think about J as being very large or should we think actually about a um, small number of discrete number of matches which are possible? So I'd... um. I'm, I, I'm inviting you to think about both the results um, hold for both the finite as well as the uh, the large number of attributes. I think uh, in the context of the internet, um, so 
we need the large number of attributes. If we need the large number of attributes, then we basically need the large number of attributes to say that um, as we have more and more of these attributes, we basically can, with this very simple model of binary attributes and uh, independent symmetric distributions, we can nonetheless generate any arbitrary distribution of values uh, after choosing a, um, a suitable concave or monotone function of the value. So, so, so that's the richness we need in order to generate all possible distribution of values. Um, is this a concern for the sellers? Um, well, uh, to begin with, I would say on the internet, typically the information is very high dimensional, is very large, right? So um, browsing histories, characteristics, past purchase history, that's typically uh, a very high dimensional set of information. Um, what we showed in some sense is that um, the relevant information is, can often be um, compressed into a much smaller, namely uh, the number of attributes below you know, think about the quantile threshold k a q star. You can also represent that by the number of matched uh, preferences. That's k star. And so, we are either going to tell the bidders you have uh, a number k that is smaller than k star or above k star. We're simply going to say that uh, you have at least k star um, attributes matched, but we don't tell you exactly how many. So there's a natural bound here, in some sense, of the richness of information that we're going to convey to the bidders in the auction. Okay, thanks. So I'm so, now seeing the hand. So maybe, yeah. So Andrea is the other one. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, so I was thinking during your talk, uh, when I think about digital ads auction, a mm -hmm. lot of time the auction here use information mm -hmm. in order to bias uh, the mapping between bids and allocation. Uh, if I think about, I know, click through you know, the bias of click-through rate bias in, in, in Google auctions and things like that. Now, mm -hmm. of course, in your model, you, you're you keeping the, the, the auction as given and you are mm -hmm. actually trying to alter competition through information. But uh, I was wondering whether there is any relation between the two. Um, um, in some sense, you're also, by pulling together high types, you are creating a lot of competition among them. Mm -hmm. And I, it's just something that I, it was in my mind just to think about uh, how these uh, uh, auctions work in the real world and, uh, and, uh, and whether there is a relation between this information design exercise and uh, the way in which this auction looks like. Yes, yeah, so, um, so thank you. That's a very nice question. So um, how... Um, the advertisers or that is the bidders have to pay for the delivery of the impression actually is quite different in sponsored search auctions. So the outcome basically of the search or on Google search engine or for that matter on any one of the other ones which are less relevant and in display advertising. So in display advertising, uh, the payment typically follows by impression. Okay, uh, in which case um, the click through is not being priced and it's not being uh, factored in. Okay, so um, strictly speaking, display advertising, uh, the click through is not being priced and, and is not relevant, it's just a paper impression. Um, but you're absolutely right that um, our analysis, um, I think, is also relevant for for sponsored search auction, where the actual ranking and the payment is the product between click through rate um, and value for the advertiser. Okay. Um, there, the issue of bias that you um, bring in is. Um, perhaps a little bit more relevant because the click-through rate is something that can possibly tracked very well by the seller or by the manager of the auction, uh, but about which the bidders uh, have much less information. And so I think, it, you know, regulators and, and maybe economists in general worry about um, how transparent these auctions are um, and, and, and I have written some things on this stuff. Um, I would say we simply don't model it here because it, it does not appear in display advertising, but it's something that we could enrich our model. Um, I would say 
that there is, of course, an extent to which the click through rate, in some sense, can be checked to be calibrated or to be truthful because um, whenever, you know, a click through rate is being estimated by the auction platform, then by running a, a, an advertising campaign, I can basically verify whether the expected click through rate is going to be calibrated. That is uh, in realization, uh, it's, it's reflected in the realized click through rate. So, um, so bias can be to some extent at least check, um, but uh, but but it remains a concern. Right. And so. Um, you know, we modeled uh, the flow of information as being sort of symmetric in terms of attributes and preferences. If we were to enrich this model to click through rate, then I would say this flow of information would be a quite a bit less symmetric and would sort of emphasize more the asymmetric information on the side of the seller or the, the auction platform who is running this, who will typically have more information about what the likely click through rate is that's coming from a search than the advertiser would have himself. Yeah. And I think that would serve uh, even further to enhance this view that we are suggesting here that in an auction, uh, at least, uh, you know, with respect to the digital environment, information is often asymmetric, not just on one side, uh, but on both sides of the market. And so I think that's, uh, I would say, overall, the theme of this paper is to say we want to think about markets where uh, the asymmetry information is two-sided and, and how to bring this together. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I have, a, I have one question and actually one clarifying question regarding the last response uh, that you gave to Andrea. So, so you mentioned revenue equivalence here. Um, so, mm -hmm. but I mean, so strictly speaking, the um, there is a gap in the support in the value yes. to the bidders. So the standard version of revenue equivalence doesn't hold, uh, but we do know in a case like that uh, there is a revenue equivalence between first and second price auction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but 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 not with the third price auction. I'm not sure whether you know about this, but. Um, and then furthermore, more importantly, you can do better than any of these standard auctions uh, uh, when you recognize this gap, you can kind of uh, further create, um, uh, uh, so yep. you, can get, you can leverage uh, the gap to extract more rents from, from them. So mm -hmm. I don't see that as really practically interesting uh, thought to have, but you know something um, that you know, it's true, right? In, in, yes. So uh, so I, you know so, so that's why I didn't give you formal result. There are results yeah. that basically um, actually I think uh, Sheng Wu Li and Mohammed Akbar will have some nice results that, that basically show that as the um, as a set of values increases, uh, there are approximation results that basically bring all of these uh, mechanisms close together. When there's not, you know, a finite discrete um, version, but they, the um, the discretization becomes uh, sort of speaks more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah, but there is a gap between optimal. There's a gap. Absolutely. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Second price option. So yeah. I wonder whether you have thought about also, uh, I mean, I, I don't see any real gain to be had, uh, I cannot imagine at least, uh, from making a, the mechanism asymmetric across bidders. Uh, but I wonder if you have thought about, uh, uh, you know, more general mechanism. Yes, and so um, we have thought about it and we have proofs that, um, for two and three bidders, the optimal mechanism is symmetric. Uh, we hope that we uh, could derive an inductive argument, but in the moment we don't have that, that generalizes us to arbitrary. Uh, but we, we don't have any examples where asymmetric information structure in this setting helps you. Um, yeah. Thanks. So uh, with regard to a clarifying question, I always thought that, you know, in the context of uh, sponsored search auctions, the click through rate becomes known to the advertisers, as well as, I mean, this is how you pay them anyway, right? Uh, as well as the, the, the platform mm -hmm. uh, publisher. Uh, uh, yeah, plat uh, mm -hmm. the, yeah, platform. Um, mm -hmm. 
but but you said that somehow i mean I, I, on the other hand the the kind of attribute information that you were talking about in fact the mm -hmm. platform does have typically i mean seems to know better so so mm -hmm. there you have a bias in favor of the platform with the click through mm -hmm. rate i thought that the information is more and more symmetric in general uh, can kind of um, yeah. well um you know both the click through rate and the value uh, in some sense have to be calibrated because eventually the value is going to be realized and so i can basically as an advertiser check whether the information that the um, that the seller provides for me is, is you know uh, at least in expectation correct um the argument for the click through rate is not quite as strong because um, while the click through rate of the winner it can of course be uh, realized and observed by the winner the price in the sponsored search auctions actually be determined by the click through rate of the loser and it is that click through rate that is actually um, sort of the tool of um, mm -hmm. of bias uh, uh, and you know this so languages of boosting and squashing of the click through rate and since that click through rate of the loser is a counterfactual that cannot be observed the winner I think the concern uh, that maybe Andrea was raising is in particular with respect to to that click through rate that is unobserved. I see, I see. It's it's, it's now more clear. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, look around. To see if there are any other people raising hands. Uh, nobody else. <laughs> um, I guess that this is a problem we have when if the when the presentation is <laughs> <That's> clear. <right. laughs> <laughs> uh, too convincing and too clear. Uh, okay. Uh, I I think time is up anyway. So with that, uh, I guess that we can close the, the, the keynote session today. Uh, thank you very much for the speaker. Thank you very much for the organizer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Julian. And thank you for the nice question, Andrea and Francis. Very nice to see you.